Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, really nice to be with you. Thanks so much for being at church today. My name is Alex Grauman. I'm the campus pastor over at our Torrance campus. So a big hello to everybody over there at Torrance. Big hello to everybody here at Manhattan Beach. Thanks for coming to church today. Merry Christmas. I don't think it's too early to say that, especially if you're a Dodger fan, right? Merry Christmas uh, to you this week. I know you've got everything that you were wishing for <laughs> this year. Um, Hey, it's a wonderful time, a wonderful season, and during this Christmas season, for this whole month, uh, we have been in this series of messages called Kingdom Come, and it's based on the Christmas stories, the Christmas narratives that we read in the Bible about Jesus' arrival on that very first Christmas. Uh, the, one of the earliest stories in those narratives comes from an angel uh, visiting with this young woman, Mary, and he promises, the angel promises Mary that she's going to have a son, and it's an amazing amazing, uh, wonderful moment in the Bible, but then he makes, this angel makes a very special promise to her about her baby boy, Jesus. He says not only will he save people from their sins, but then this very distinct promise comes. He says his kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, will never end. And so during this season, uh, we have been focusing specifically on that word kingdom, that not only was Jesus born to grow up and show us the perfection of a moral life and then uh, die on a cross to take the punishment that we deserve for the things we've done wrong so we can be forgiven and reconnected with God, not only those incredibly wonderful things, but also he was ushering in a unique, a new kind of kingdom. And so in this series, we've been exploring what does that kingdom mean in our lives? Now, the way we've been defining kingdom for the purposes of this message series have been this. We're talking about Jesus' influence and authority in all areas of our life. So we're not looking for political power. We're not looking for big castles of a kingdom. We're looking for the kingdom that we can be citizens of right now, that we can take part of. What would that look like? In fact, what do the Christmas stories, the Christmas narratives in the Bible, show us about what kind of kingdom that this is and what kind of citizens we can be in this kingdom. Uh, today, we're gonna talk through uh, another one of these early uh, Christmas narratives from scriptures, and here's the one we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at the angels and the shepherds, uh, and you can find that in the book of Luke chapter two. Now, I consider this to be the most famous Christmas story in our contemporary world, and that is for one very specific reason. This is the story that Linus reads to people at the end of a Charlie Brown Christmas. Now, just for show of hands, have you, has, who has seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? Okay, some of you. Uh, I really want to give you the assignment this year uh, of watching a Charlie Brown Christmas. It's a short, I think it's 22 minutes long, uh, animated cartoon from the comics of Charlie Brown brought to life. It was made in 1965. I'm telling you this, some people are like, yeah, of course we know. But there are generations that have not watched a Charlie Brown Christmas, and they should. Am I right? Uh, the theme of the show is that Charlie Brown isn't feeling Christmas that year. He doesn't understand the meaning of Christmas. At the end of the special, he asks, doesn't anyone know what Christmas is all about? I'm spoiling it here, but you should still watch it. And his buddy Linus says, I can tell you, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And he goes and he reads verbatim from the translation that was often used at that time, the story from the Bible that we're about to read and explore today. It's an incredible moment of television history. By the way, if you do want to watch it, by the way, that's your assignment, so everyone should watch it this season. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. Another show of hands, how many people subscribe to Apple TV+. Plus? If you don't, good job, some of you, but it's really expensive nowadays, isn't it? Hey. Tim Cook and I worked it out, though, and next weekend, the Charlie Brown Christmas special is available for free to all viewers, technically in the whole world, but I think it's just for our purposes here. I want you to watch it because the idea of a cartoon Christmas special ending with someone reading a verbatim passage of scripture is revolutionary. It was then, still is today. In fact, that's why I think it's the most famous because even for people, tens of thousands, hundreds, maybe millions of people who have never read the Bible, millions of them have heard this part of scripture uh, about the angels visiting the shepherds. So that's, that's an important enough reason to watch a Charlie Brown Christmas special. But I also want to have you look out for one more thing that even if you've seen it many, many times, you may not have noticed, and it has to do with the credits of a Charlie Brown Christmas. Charlie Brown Christmas, of course, is an animated special, but if you watch the end credits, you'll notice that there are no animators listed. 
Instead, Charles Schultz, the creator of Charlie Brown, and the producers of the special decided to give them a different title uh, for the animators for their special. So here's what it is. I know it's hard to see up here, but they have labeled them not as animators, but people who provided graphic blandishment. That's how they describe them. And this description, graphic blandishment, <laughs> has piqued the interest of those who stick around the credits since 1965. Why did they decide to call these animators graphic blandishmenters? And the reason is so fascinating because blandishment sounds like it has uh, its roots in the, in the term bland. And that would seem like a lowly way to describe the good work that these animators did on this Christmas special. But it also, if you look into the deeper definition of what blandishment means, it is based on bland, but it's almost this idea of being so humble that it's endearing, that you do bring a blandness that brings comfort to people, that peps something bland up by how endearing you are in that. And it's a perfect description of a Charlie Brown Christmas special because Charlie Brown himself, that's who the star of this show is, Charlie Brown, look at him there. Charlie Brown is a humble guy. Charlie Brown is uh, overly trusting of the people in his life, often to his detriment. In fact, Charles Schultz, the creator, described this character as someone far more familiar with losing than winning. Now, what I want to say is that Charlie Brown is all of us. You should watch this because in a lot of ways, it's our story, isn't it? Do you ever feel like that in your life? That you are often more familiar with what it feels like to lose than to win? But I want to start there, actually, with our own lives. Because some of us feel a little bit Charlie Brownish this time of year. Where we look, I think people in the past compared themselves maybe to their neighbors or to their family or people in their neighborhood. That's not our issue anymore. We, we do that still, but we also compare ourselves to every single person <laughs> in the world, on the planet, because of the internet and social media. Especially if you're a social media user, you know that twinge, that feeling of watching someone else and in comparison, feeling a little bit more humbled feeling like, boy, that person just seems to have it easier than I do. In comparison to that person, I'm a little more lowly than I want to. In fact, have you, uh, the message that Instagram, that TikTok, that Facebook, whatever you use has for you today is you're really pretty bland, aren't you? And it's not just your life, it's you personally that are the problem. <laughs> um, your job, it's not that great. Your kids are not as cute uh, or as funny as you think they are. You don't, certainly don't make enough money to live in the right place, and even if you wanted to make a fun video online, you wouldn't even have the stuff in the background to show off that you are a person of wealth. Really, in general, you are sort of less than, aren't you? Now, of course, that's not coming from me. I love you. <laughs> but have you ever felt that message from the world, from our culture, creeping into your heart? Especially this time of year, we are prone to feeling, hey, maybe I'm a little more lowly than I want to be. In comparison to others, maybe it's the burdens I bear, maybe it's the relationships that I, I want to have that I don't, that we can be brought down. We can be humbled a little bit. Even if we know better, we can still feel those feelings of, boy, I'm feeling a little bit like Charlie Brown this year. Here, if you're feeling that this year, or if you've ever felt that, or have a friend going through that, I have some incredible good news about what we learn about God's kingdom from the Christmas stories. And it has to do with our sense of being lowly or humbled. When you are there, here's our main point for today. Let me read it to you. When we're humbled, that's when we can experience Jesus' humble leadership. We spend so much of our lives trying to avoid this feeling that we were our lower rank than other people, where the message of Jesus' kingdom that arrived on that first Christmas day is that humility is the highest honor, that Jesus himself comes with humble leadership and he doesn't bring that message to people in mansions. He doesn't bring that, that message to the highest politicians, the most famous people of that time. He brings his message of salvation to the lowliest people possible. And that's where we're gonna look in our story because it stars the shepherds 
uh, who the angels bring the message of God's incredible gift to those lowly people. So if you're there, the story of the shepherds and the angels is all of our story. And I wanna show you in the time we have together two ways that we can take steps to receive Jesus' leadership when we are feeling humbled, when we are feeling lowly. Let me show you the first one. First way we can do that is we need to embrace humility as our starting point. We need to not just feel lowly, we need to say, I embrace that feeling. I actually am less than sometimes. So let me show you how that plays out in our story. Remember, we're talking from this section here, the book of Luke chapter two. This section story takes place on the very same night that Jesus, baby Jesus, was born in the city of Bethlehem, which you can see behind me. I, I'm coming to you live from Bethlehem, it turns out. Uh, but, but it's that very same night. Now, what we read about the shepherds, we're finally gonna get it to. This is what you'll hear in the Charlie Brown Christmas special from Linus. Here's how the story begins. Here's what it says. That same night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Now, I've, I've said this a few times uh, this year, but my wife and I were gifted the opportunity early uh, in 2003, uh, 2023 to visit uh, Israel. And we were able to visit the city of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And it was an incredible moment for us because actually, let me show you a picture. Uh, here it is, it's not, there's nothing. <laughs> it is these rolling few hills outside of the city of Bethlehem. And on those hills, there was no gaudy tourist trap, uh, buy a souvenir shop. It was just three or four hills. And it was one of those incredible moments where the tour guide that was leading us was legitimately able to say the story of the shepherds, where they were watching their sheep, either took place right where you're standing or it took place right there, that's it. And it was not flashy, it was humble rolling hills. Now this picture of course, because we were on a tour, was taken during the day. But there is a key element of that first sentence we just read together is that they were not watching in the story, I'm sure they did during the day, but that story doesn't take place in the day, does it? No, when were they watching their fields of, of sheep? They were watching them at night. Now we need to understand, I know we're only one sentence, we need to understand the gravity of how dark it was for these shepherds. That these shepherds watching their fields and their flocks by night were experiencing a layer, a level of dark that we can almost have a hard time comprehending in our modern world. Because this was long before the advent of available electricity that they knew how to harness, and they were trying to get their sheep to sleep. So they didn't probably even have open campfires or torches with them. Other than the stars, what they were experiencing was ancient society levels of deep Darkness. Even with Bethlehem close by, they weren't seeing the glint of electric streetlights. <laughs> they were out in a dark field all alone where no one could see them. Now, I want to make a symbolic connection here. Does your life ever feel like this? Do you ever feel like you are living inside of a darkness that you just can't shake? Again, maybe that's because of a relationship that has soured. Maybe that's because of uh, one of your kids who has uh, taken a left turn that you don't know what to do about. Maybe that's because a, you're having a struggle at work or with your finances or you're trying to make a big decision and only failing to make that the right decision time after time. Have you ever felt a weight comparable to the ancient darkness that they were feeling that night. I think many of us have. In fact, I think that darkness for those shepherds was part of the norm. In, in our culture, again, symbolically, we can feel like darkness is the norm for us. I mentioned that we took that trip to Israel. Now even the mention of Israel is filled with a weight because we know that there are battles, people losing lives daily in those same places, not far from those rolling hills that I was just able to point at. We know that some of you are in the Redondo uh, School District and faced some fear this week of some, some challenging situations at the high school. We're praising God for no violence, but at the same time, I know that we've been praying along with many of you who have felt a local darkness that you're struggling with. 
Each one of us could say, despite the world blasting us in the face with its artificial light, that sometimes we feel like we're living in a place that could be defined by dark. If you are there today, I want to encourage you to say, yes, that's where I am. Because an admittance that we often try to push aside, the admittance of this dark place that you might be in, is the perfect place to experience the contrast that is about to happen in the lives of the shepherds. We're not only gonna be inspired by the darkness that they must have felt, we're gonna be inspired by the light that God brings into their darkness and transform it. Here's what happens next. Remember, they're out in the fields, they're alone with their sheep, it's pitch black, but then, here's what Luke says, suddenly, An angel of the Lord appeared among them. Sometimes we think of this angel above them far away, right? No, among the shepherds and sheep, there's this angel. And what's he doing? The radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were suddenly inside of what almost seems like a palpable light, a brilliance of God's glory. They were what? They were terrified, understandably so. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, He said, yeah, right, angel. (laughs) I mean, this is that moment where they are taken from absolute stillness and darkness into God's glory. We hear other stories in the Bible of people who got to glimpse God's glory. Moses, the ancient patriarch, got to see part of God's glory and his face, the skin on his face glowed (laughs) for several days. That doesn't even make sense. But being able for humans to experience the radiance of God's glory is madness, is overwhelming. But the, the, the necessity of God putting them in a dark place so that when his radiance appears, it is life transforming is what we need to beg God for. We need to say, God, that's what I need in my darkness. I don't need some wealth. I don't need some prestige. I need your glory and healing light to fill me up. That might even be a scary proposition, Lord, because of how much I need your transformation in my life. But God's message through this angel to the shepherds is the same that he has for you and for I. And don't forget, here's what it is. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You live in a dark world, but I am greater than the darkness. God's light destroys, eliminates the darkness. Now, I wish I could promise you that it would be as instant, as unexpected as it was for those shepherds, but I still think we can take inspiration with inviting God to bring his light, to turn, to reorient ourselves towards his glory, focusing on him and his goodness, not our own, but instead to let him, maybe that's something you pray for this whole month, of Lord, fill me with your light. In my dark time that I've been, will you fill me with your light? In fact, I have an action step that I would love for you to participate in. Here's what it is. I wanna challenge you to write out the ways that you feel low. What are those things that are in your life that are making you feel like you're in a low, in a dark spot? And then consider how those make you a target of God's love, not a hindrance to it. The world has a message to you that is, you are messed up. You do not have things together. And guess what? It's time to rebel. And it's time for us to say, you're right. I am a mess. I don't have things together. But that isn't a bad place to be. The world means that message to break us down. We need to say, yes, but then that makes me a target of God's humble leadership and love. That is, I am exactly who God came to rescue in my darkness. It can be the beginning point of understanding him in a new way. Maybe for you, I don't know if this resonates with you, I feel like our house is messy all the time. It's no one else's fault but mine. But I put things down and I do not pick them up. I stack laundry and I do not fold it. It is just there. Do you have the piles that we have at our house? Please tell me you have the piles that you have in my house. And I feel like, how is everyone else doing this? (laughs) How are you all pulling this off? I feel low about that. In my job, I keep making mistakes. Do you make mistakes in your job? And then you're like, I let that person down again. I didn't respond to this thing, and then they had to call me out on it. I'm, I'm trying, and yet I'm having these notches where I'm like humbled 
moment after moment, but the difference is I can learn a lesson from these shepherds to say, when I'm humbled, Lord, that's why I need your rescue. Remember that survey we took a few weeks ago? Some of you got, at the end of that survey, a, a result that was called trusting, which meant that in the, a lot of areas, you are really thriving in connection with God, but you're struggling in your finances. And the survey labeled that as trusting, not as, oh, geez, you better figure this out because finances are really important. The result was, hey, the challenges you're having in your finances are the opportunity for you. You are the target of God's love then. If you're feeling lowly in that way, keep trusting God. That's not a hindrance to God's love. That makes you fully available in your humble place. So that's the first thing. It can be the beginning spot humility can to experience God. Here's the second one. We need to do this. We need to use humility as a catalyst for mission. Uh, sometimes in our humility, we are on the perfect spot to find our life purpose, to engage with sharing God's love, not just in our lives, but with other people around us. And that comes again from the shepherds. I wanna show you another. We're going sentence by sentence sort of today. Here's the next thing that the angel says. Remember the angels, the glory, God's glory is shining all around. He says, don't be afraid. And then here's the next sentence with the angel's message. The angel says, I bring you, the shepherds, good news that will bring great joy to all people. Now again, I know there's only one more sentence, but I wanna focus on that phrase, to all people. I want us to understand what the shepherds must have heard when they heard that phrase. Because these were not socialites. These were guys working a blue collar job at best out in the fields during the night shift. These were not guys who went to the local evening parties and got to know a lot of people. They were people who were out in the fields. They had to work. They couldn't go to those parties. And when they were done with their night shift, they didn't come home and interact with people in the town square because they were really social people. No, they came home smelling of their night, exhausted and smelly from their time handling sheep. They probably were people that in addition to feeling darkness sometimes in their lives were often associated with, here's another word, they probably felt isolated. They probably felt alone. Loneliness was probably part of the shepherd experience. But God sees these guys and inside of the promise that God is bringing through this angel, remember the angel, let's bring it back up, the angel builds in <laughs> a movement of God. He says, I bring you guys good news that will bring great joy to all people. He has built into this message a move for these shepherds from isolation to connection, from isolation to mission. Sometimes we're like, I have to get to a certain level of Christianity, a certain level of getting my life together, and then I'll share the good news with a friend or a neighbor. God is saying it's exactly the opposite. When you are humble, when you are at your lowest point, that's the moment he may want to use you to be part of his mission because you know who else feels that all the time? Everybody. Everybody feels, I'm low, there's no way that God could love me and you are this person who has the good news to bring to all of those people. Let's look at what the good news is. Here, it's incredible what the angel says. Here's the message for all those people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Up to that point, it is a grand message. The Messiah has come in David's city, the ancient patriarch. His heir has finally come to bring this kingdom. What a huge, important message. But then there's this twist. He says, here's how you'll recognize him. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. What a twist. The king of heaven is arriving to change existence forever, and he arrives in the most humble place, wrapped in, I was imagining this week, strips of cloth. Remember when Krista held up that nasty blanket a few weeks ago? He's wrapped in itchy, the blanket, and lying in a place that animals should be eating. The shepherds were probably like, what <laughs> are you talking about? It's an incredibly, the humble God goes to humble people and says, the humble kingdom has arrived. 
Your isolation can end because now I am sending you out with a message that lowliness is a kingdom value. I want to just for a second, take kind of a left turn here uh, to, to tell you, the, read you the next part of the story because things go nuts. It gets wild at this point in the story. Remember, up to this point, there was only one angel. Uh, this, that all changes because suddenly zillions, uncountable number of angels show up and I have a theory about this moment. But let me read to you what happens. Suddenly, again, Luke is very into this. Suddenly, that angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. This glory to God in the highest heaven. That's the song, if you were here at the beginning of our service, when we say, glory, oh, yeah. in, ex- in excelsis Deo, that's this line in Latin, glory to God in the highest. That's what our journey kids carolers are gonna sing and lead us into uh, on Christmas Eve services. It's this line that that comes from, glory to God in the highest. Now, here's my theory about this section that we'll only be able to ask God about in the heavens. So if we see each other there, can you remind me to ask him about this? This is the only time it's going to be verified. But I have a suspicion that God's command for this story was only to that one angel. He was like, hey, one angel, I have a job. I want you to send, I want to send you to Bethlehem so that you can tell these shepherds uh, that I've arrived. I think that was the whole plan. And these angels, this was just spontaneous. They couldn't get enough of the odd, incredible, glorious plan that God had. And they're like, we're going to. In fact, we're going to burst in at the end with this song we've been prepping. Um, Because they just show up in this incredible way. How odd, how curious the human race must be to these angels. How unique. They know who we are. We are flimsy, fragile Flawed. I didn't mean for that to be so alliterative, but it was beautiful, wasn't it? We are people who are broken and messy and sinful, and God shows up as one of us to rescue us. I can imagine those angels are like, we got to come up with a song. Glow. They figured that one out for us. Listen, let's get back because the, the, right after this, these angels who I think were unbidden disappear. And here's what happens next that connects us back to mission. When those angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, well, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger. Their socks were blown off, but it didn't end there. Here's what they did next. These lowly, humble guys, after seeing him, the shepherds, they told everyone, what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished and Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And then the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying, praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. These were humble guys. They had back to their humble situation. They took this message and they didn't just keep it. They sent it to everyone. They shared the good news of God's presence and rescue in their lives. And let me, uh, let's just review what we talked about today here as we get to the close. When we are humbled, in that position of being lowly, of being humbled, that's when we can best experience Jesus' humble leadership. How? When we can embrace humility as our starting point and use humility as a catalyst for mission. I want to end here with just really focusing on that mission. Um, we, we do this on purpose. Uh, let me show you an action step that I will not surprise you here in the Christmas season. Here's what it is. I want you to invite someone else who's in a humble spot to our Christmas Eve services. The, these are people who are not foreign to you. You don't have to look far before you find someone who's feeling really low in their lives. They might cover it well, but they need an invitation. They need you to be the light that God has sent to fill up their darkness with an invitation, an invitation to what our Christmas Eve services are, a time of celebrating the God that's not far away. He is with us. He came to be with us. He can forgive and restore us in ways that no one else can come close to matching. And not only that, but they will not be alone. They'll be among other people along on this journey of looking for that light. Please, 
Consider, let, let God inspire you to consider who is it that I wouldn't this year come alone with my family, but instead I would have my radar up because man, am I feeling humbled. So now God is calling me to the mission of inviting someone else to experience his light. Hey, as we close here, I'm just gonna close us in prayer. Will you stand both here and at Torrance? Will you stand with me as we close uh, this, this Christmas? Hey, I, I do wanna mention as you're standing, every week we try to mention that there's a, a cross over here at both campuses. You can see it lit over there. We'll have some fantastic volunteers and staff over there that would love to just spend a few extra minutes in conversation with you. Maybe you have something heavy on you that you'd like to have prayer for. They would love to uh, open their hearts to you to share part of your story, but then to bring that request before God along with you. It would be a wonderful way to spend five more minutes of your Sunday. All right, let me pray for us before we leave today. Dear God, thank you for arriving in our lives, in my life. Thank you, Lord God, for even the darkness, the isolation that we can sometimes feel. You are the great filler of our lives. You want to bring your radiance, your glory, your love into that place where we feel dark and isolated. Lord God, connect us to one another Drive us into purpose and mission, allowing us to share with those in need. Who is it, Lord God, that you wanna point us to this week? Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving them. Give us bravery and boldness as we go from this place to follow you. We pray today in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, have a great Sunday. Thank you for being here.